thank you for the introduction, um, and thank you everyone for coming here. Uh, I promise it will be an interesting talk. If you are looking for a technology deep dive, that's the right kind of talk. Um, and then there will be lunch, so it should be pleasant. Uh, let me introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I am a data engineer. I'm working in Walmart Labs, and uh, I guess not all of you may know what Walmart Lab does. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about Walmart first before we go into the uh, actual technology. Uh, to the subject of the today talk is um, we uh, tend to use many Flink pipelines. All right, if you start adopting Flink. It's not a single pipeline that you'll be running. You'll be running many, probably even um, thousands or hundreds of pipelines. And you need to integrate them somehow. There's a, a common data store, or a common data lake, or common buffers. So today, I'm going to talk about one particular kind of buffer, which is a distributed cache. And we have experience building such buffer on a large scale using Akka. So it's Akka and Flink, all right? So, I'll introduce Walmart Labs and uh, what my group called Smart Pricing does there. Then uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we can integrate those pipelines. And then we'll dive deep and see how we can implement the distributed data cache buffer. And finally, I'll tell you some uh, stories from the actual production usage. So what are the pitfalls and uh, how well does it perform? Walmart Labs. Uh, Walmart basically is uh, number two in uh, retail space right now, globally. Uh, it's uh, probably the uh, largest competitor of Amazon. In, uh, on a 100,000 feet view, Walmart is another Amazon. So larger physical operations, smaller e-commerce operation, but it's pretty much like Amazon. Um, we have pretty much the same catalog size, uh, pretty much the same vendor pool size, logistics, uh, retail locations, and so on and so forth. Um, in some areas, Walmart is ahead of Amazon, like groceries, which will be an, an interesting area to compete this year and next year. Uh, in other areas, we are smaller, like e-commerce operations, we are probably three times smaller than Amazon. But still, pretty large. Um, so um, my group within Walmart, Walmart Labs is actually a technology unit within Walmart. So there's a big Walmart with all of these physical locations. Uh, I don't even know uh, how many we have right now. Probably about 10,000 all over the world. Half of them are in the US. There may be even some uh, chains that Walmart owns here in Germany. I know that we definitely have some operations in UK and uh, in China, Brazil, uh, India. But I'm part of the uh, technology unit called Warrant Labs. It's roughly 5,000 people. Um, and we develop all the technology for Walmart. In particular, everything that walmart.com needs, this large portal, is coming from us. Within Walmart Labs, um, there is multiple units. We have our own cloud technology called OneUps. Um, uh, I'm part of a group called Smart Pricing. We are responsible for algorithmic pricing of every item in Walmart catalog, which is a lot and pretty important function. So every day, we reprice the entire catalog in real time. And we are also managing a thing called Walmart Marketplace, which is a marketplace where third parties can sell their items. And the Walmart basically is charging a little commission. So uh, today I'll tell you about Marketplace primarily. Marketplace is very large. It uh, has more than 100 million items right now. And vendors operate pretty much independently. But we uh, regulate a little bit. So we uh, impose certain bounds on uh, prices on, the, on those items. And uh, vendors have to comply or we will delist the item. All right. So we use a lot of uh, intelligent algorithms in pricing, mostly economic models and uh, some machine learning models based on uh, real-time inputs, like competitive data analysis, for example. So we track our competitors, and we want to stay competitive, and we want to reprice if competitors' price change in real time. Uh, we ingest a lot of data. So um, pretty much every piece of data that Walmart has flows through us because you can incorporate this into pricing. For example, all physical store prices, we monitor. All competitor prices, we monitor. Uh, all attributes of the item set up, we have to ingest. And sometimes even third party sources, like, um, I don't know, social network analytics, which items are trending, or uh, vendors' uh, information systems. So we have to ingest some vendor data to price it properly. Um, 
And another important aspect is, and this is relatively recent, and it happened over the last two years, is we used to do, to do it in a batch mode offline every day. Uh, so we were running those algorithms in Askaman. And a couple of years ago, we switched to real time. So uh, that's where we adopted Flink. And now uh, Flink is running it for us. And we try to respond to those ingested signals as fast as possible. So uh, latencies are typically less than a minute. All right. So basically, that gives us more opportunities to be competitive and uh, not to lose money. And, uh, but it's getting hard to monitor these things. <laughs> so uh, we had to deploy a pretty sophisticated monitoring system. Another important aspect is because of the size of the ingestion, uh, we have to closely control our backlogs and we have to apply rate limits. So uh, in particular, downstream systems that we uh, publish our items, our price items, they are typically slower than us, and our upstreams, where we ingest from, are typically much faster than us. So we are kind of, we have to buffer it, but we cannot afford backlog, and we have to basically institute pretty good uh, rate limiting policies. So I'll tell you a little bit about this, okay? But that's pretty much what we do, and now let's uh, go see how we do it, all right? So, a little bit more information about this marketplace because that's, uh, that's the uh, use case that we uh, apply the um, distributed data cache form. It's much larger than our primary 1P catalog. So, 1P catalog is roughly 10 million items right now. This is the items that Walmart.com sells, but those are the most important ones. That's where Walmart makes all the money. Marketplace is where vendors make money. And uh, we just want to give them this opportunity and uh, attract more customers. And maybe charge a little commission because we actually provide logistics services. Okay? But at the moment, it's uh, maybe a little bit over 100 million items and it's growing pretty fast. So we expect that it will probably grow twice as much in two years. It's very fluid. Okay? So vendor onboarding and item setup is automated. So vendors do it through their system. It's done in bulk. And we just ingest the catalog change events, and we have thousands of catalog change events per second. So this is one of the largest ingestion sources that we have. I believe at the moment it's between three and five thousand messages per sec. Okay? And for those uh, items, we also have to ingest competitive prices, and we have to ingest physical store price changes and inventory availability. Those are other big ingestion sources. So competitive primarily comes from Amazon and other competitors. A lot of signals and uh, it's done in real time. Uh, physical stores, they usually publish in bulk every day, but because there are so many stores, we kind of receive it gradually over time. Um, yeah, and uh, what we want to do with this marketplace is based on any significant change in those ingested sources, we want to run our algorithms uh, compute the price bounds, and apply them to the third-party catalog and see if we need to delist certain items. And sometimes we also provide those recommendations to vendors who would like to set up pricing based on our recommendations. Uh, we do it in real time, right? And um, the ingestion has a very rich data model. And uh, the bad aspect of it is that it's, uh, the schema there is pretty much non-existent. So, uh, most of the ingestion sources, they are just JSON, which we know nothing about. So we have to put structure on top of the semi-structured JSON data. And uh, this is where some of the expense comes. So just uh, converting those uh, loose JSON files into our schema objects, which are based on protobuf, takes some CPU because of the ingestion is so, so large. Um, even this operation is expensive, okay? So other challenges. So the main one is that the ingestion is basically a fire hose. Okay? So it's a huge pipe, huge pipe. We have billions of events per day. Okay? And I mentioned it's semi-structured. We cannot do anything expensive there other than putting a structure and just storing this. Uh, I'll show you the picture on the next slide, but basically we have a data store and we just send 
a bunch of writes and micro batches to that store. That's all we do on digestion. Okay, and that's pretty much all that you can do in a firehose. So the idea is that this firehose just should keep on writing at whatever cost. Okay, and then we'll see what we can do later. Um, what you want to do later is you would like to run all of your uh, analytics and models as some sort of pipeline processors, right? And uh, you would like to deploy them as streaming microservices. So uh, microservices means that each uh, model is basically um, a pool of servers, right? And they probably support some kind of duplex streaming protocol. And uh, we tend to use uh, Google RPC. It's just slightly better than regular HTTP. Um, and in order to use those microservices, we actually run them within Flink pipelines. Okay, so Flink allows us to scale, and basically, typical Flink operator that we use is a sync map, and uh, it just invokes those services. All right. Now, backlog control. I mentioned that we work as a big buffer because upstream is much faster than us, and downstream is much slower. And we cannot tolerate any backlogs in the marketplace because there will be never an opportunity to catch up. So we tend to use Kafka buffers in our 1P pipelines. So that's where we can tolerate a little bit of backlog. So we can accumulate, like, I don't know, maybe up to 50 million of uh, records in, in a Kafka topic as a backlog because we know that there will be an opportunity to drain this backlog later, probably overnight. But here, Marketplace Firehose is so fast and runs constantly, there will be never an opportunity to basically burn through the backlog. So we just can't tolerate it, and uh, we have to impose very strict limits on the size of the backlog. So let's call it a buffer then, because it's very limited, all right? And finally, that rate limit controls, okay? Uh, ideally, we would like basically to set up a pretty much constant rate limit on our downstream sinks, okay? Because we know at which rate our downstream systems can basically ingest our data, right? So they tell us the SLA, and that's the rate that we would like to publish, okay? Um, so that's how we actually do it through this cache, but we don't want to impose any rate limits on the firehose, okay? So downstream has a strict limit, uh, upstream doesn't have any limit, and it's much, much faster than downstream, okay? Finally, um, we have to apply collocation and co-sharding. Collocation means that our data store has to be collocated with Flink, which is unusual, uh, mostly because if we are located outside, then we will not be able to process writes with ultra-low latency. So we use Cassandra. Cassandra has very, very fast writes, but if you have to incur network cost all the time, then you cannot have writes with latency of less than one millisecond. Okay, so that will be like five milliseconds, which is too much for us. So writes has to be under one milliseconds. So we collocate, and uh, we also co-shard. So this talk will actually cover sharding aspects a lot. So what co-sharding means is that in order to process this in parallel, we have to partition our catalog in kind of independent shards, right? And all those microservices, uh, they have to share the same sharding scheme, okay? So the idea is that within a shard, we pretty much run an independent sequence of steps, okay? And all of the processing happens on the same machine. So we don't actually send data over the network because there's a lot of data. We would rather do all the compute at the same place with this data. And that makes sense, actually, because, I mean, if you think about it, you ingested this data, then you are invoking those microservices and you run Flink. Why not do it on, on the same machine? because that's internal, internal operations. So external is the, those streaming sources that we ingest from, and also external is downstream, but everything else, in my opinion, should be run on the same machines. So think about it as one big cluster where we run it, and it's primarily Flink and Akka. Okay, so let's see this big picture. That's how we do it. So in the upper left corner, that's where ingestion starts. and. Uh, this picture actually shows you a bunch of integration partners. I'll uh, dive deep into each one on the next slide. But at the ingestion, we apply a partner called what we call the micro ATL. So basically, these are very, very small and simple Flink pipelines. And we, we run each Flink pipe on each source. And we uh, have probably about 10, maybe uh, 12 sources right now. So each one looks similar. 
So typically, they connect to some Kafka topic uh, for, the, uh, for the upstream. They get JSON data. They convert it to a protobuf, and they uh, microbatch the updates and send them as Cassandra writes. OK, that's very simple. So convert and write. Uh, we also have uh, an application which vendors use, so they can update the attributes for their items through it. And they actually produce the same type of Cassandra updates. Finally, our algorithms, whenever they finish, they publish the information to the same Cassandra table. Okay. So all of this is ingestion, and uh, the task of the ingestion is run it as a firehose and just deliver data to Cassandra. And we need to make sure that those Cassandra writes are ultra low latency. Okay. Um, downstream of that, we apply a change data capture, uh, which basically streams uh, row change events out of Cassandra. Okay, it's completely asynchronous, runs on the background, um, and this thing typically shares those events. And um, the most important consumer is cache publisher. So we take those events. We aggregate them, we join them, and we publish to cache. There's a pattern that we apply here that we call Uber item. Okay, Uber item is so in the cache we have we tend to have a big container of everything. So there is multiple tables in Cassandra. There is multiple attributes that we want to get from each table. So we want to join those tables and put it into one big data container. Right? That's what we call an Uber item. So in order to make joins easy, and sometimes we also aggregate over time, we apply this Uber item pattern. I'll tell you about it. But basically, there's a lot of uh, read events coming from Cassandra through change data capture. We basically apply them and merge them into this Uber item uh, container, which is stored in the cache. Okay, And we run this as a Flink pipeline, so there's a cache thing here. Now, cache is the, uh, the buffer here, OK? So it kind of decouples uh, slower downstream operations from faster upstream. Uh, two important differences compared to, a, let's say, a Kafka buffer, OK? Kafka is pretty good. It actually, it, you, can, you can run very large operations pretty fast in Kafka. But it has two things that were not good fit for us in this particular use case. The first thing is Kafka has an unlimited backlog. Okay, if your downstream is slower than your upstream, then uh, your backlog in, in, Kafka, in, in Kafka would grow unlimited until the retention policy kicks in and uh, the data is flushed. But you are basically losing data at this point, which is like very very bad. But let's say your retention is long, then your backlog will grow unlimited. Uh, every uh, every write to Kafka is an independent record, so it's just stack in the uh, in the log, right? So uh, in this cache. We don't have that. So uh, the sizes of our cache shards are very limited. Okay? So we control them, and we can set them as we want. All the writes to cache, they are actually mutating long-living key value pairs. So we are just mutating data. We reapply those changes instead of producing an independent kind of message. So that's how we absorb, and that's, that's what keeps the backlog limited. Because we mutate, all right? Typically, let's say you are just crawling in downstream and publishing, let's say, one algorithm run per item per day, OK? You can always run it like this. Let's run it once per day. Uh, you will basically run it on the latest snapshot of an Uber item. And this snapshot may have accumulated all the small changes over the day. Make sense? So we don't care. We don't want to respond to every change if we can't. Right? Because our downstream will not absorb it. So let's just accumulate it. So that's the key difference compared to Kafka. Uh, another key difference, and this is, this is what we put into the, uh, into, the, into the cash consumer, is we wanted to apply rate limiting control explicitly. Okay? So in the cash consumer, we have a parameter that specifies at which rate this cash consumer will consume. Okay? It's essentially based on polling. And if you poll, you can control the rate at which you poll. Okay? In Kafka, it's also a polling scheme, but you don't, you don't control the rate there. Okay? You will poll as fast as it can, basically. And the worst part about Kafka, 
and that's coming from our experience, but that maybe it's not true for everyone, is if you have backlog in your topic, yeah, Kafka consumers don't really allow you to control which partitions are pulled first, okay? So sometimes you, you burn backlog in just one partition, another partition just sit there, okay? I think it may be the way the Flink uses Kafka, but uh, that's our experience. So here, we would like to drain it uniformly, okay? So our cache consumer, it pulls multiple shards, typically hundreds of shards, and it gives them fair polling, okay? So we drain them uniformly. So rate, explicit rate control, and uh, strict limit on backlog. That's the two attributes of this uh, caching source. Other than that, you can think about it as, as Kafka, because it has kind of same features. It has replication, uh, it has kind of uh, independent sharding, and within each shard, we process sequentially. So same thing as Kafka does. So downstream of this, uh, we are running Flink pipes, which invoke those uh, microservices through gRPC. Um, and then once we ran everything, uh, we publish to a downstream Kafka. That's where our uh, portal, warmer.com consumers are. Okay? And they give us those SLAs where we derive the rates from. So that's our marketplace. Um, and um, the reason I'm showing you this picture is that I wanted to, to show you that, it, first of all, it has those multiple flink pipes. Second, they operate at different speed. And third, we use different integration partners that are more appropriate for a particular use case. So uh, let's see them in more details. So MicroATL, that's the Firefox partner, right? No back pressure, no complex logic, no backlogging, and very low latency rates. So if you ever need a Firehose, choose the proper technology that should address this, this aspects, okay? Um, Cassandra changed data capture. Um, I can talk a lot about it. <laughs> so Cassandra doesn't come with change data capture. Actually, that's not entirely correct. It comes with triggers and CDC mechanisms that are not production ready. So if you think about using them, think twice. They're not production ready. Um, so you would rather build your own if you want to use it at scale. There's lots of counterparts of Cassandra that are coming from different vendors. They typically have a good CDC mechanism, but open source Cassandra does not. So we built our own, and it's based on Akka. Um, and it's very simple, actually. The idea there is apply sharding so, um, and do it on a background. So uh, we basically run it periodically, like every second. Uh, we query a bunch of changes from Cassandra for a shard, because that's the way Cassandra queries are. You have to specify the, uh, the, basically the partition ID, right? And we process them and publish them as full row update events downstream, okay? Downstream typically is our cache. That's the cache writer. So it periodically receives micro batches from each shard because there are so many shards, there's pretty much constant traffic, right? And we publish them to cache. So the Uber item pardon, uh, I mentioned this is the way we want to merge things easily. So think about multiple tables in Cassandra. Each table represents a micro ETL from upstream, okay? So maybe this is the table for store prices. This is the table for inventory updates. This is the table for uh, competitive prices. Now, in cache, you would like to aggregate all of it, okay? Because your algorithm requires all of it, all right? So cache is there primarily for running those uh, algorithmic models. So how do we aggregate? Uh, it's very simple. So we basically share the same data schema for that Uber item, okay? It's a part of entity with many, many fields, a lot of fields, okay? But each subset of fields is owned by a particular MicroTL, particular Cassandra table. So the task of each publish event is just to create a default uh, instance of that product of entity and just set the fields that it has, okay? Maybe three fields, maybe five fields. So they all produce those kind of deltas, okay? And then we just merge those deltas as updates to cache. Think about it as kind of some sort of update query, okay? Where update can set an arbitrary set of fields. So those are pretty fast, actually, okay? Because we don't have to kind of wait and join explicitly. 
we can independently process each event and uh, kind of accumulate the updates over time. Same idea applies to aggregations. So aggregations typically means that you receive multiple signals over time and you would like to store them as a collection. Okay, so just define a collection field in Proto and just keep adding to that collection. Uh, and because this is our own code and uh, this is based on Proto, we don't suffer from things like tombstones in Cassandra. Like if you're familiar, collections in Cassandra are pretty expensive because they're tombstones. Okay. Um, now the cache. So this is the, uh, this is the new thing that we developed. Uh, initially, I thought, yeah, it's a good idea to have cache, but we want to have this rate limit and uh, we want to control the backlogs. So maybe someone already developed something like this. And uh, what we realized is that uh, in Flink, there is uh, connectors for Redis and other caches, but they're all sinks. Okay, there's no sources. And I started thinking about it, why no one wrote a source for Redis? Because Redis is very popular and uh, it comes with pops up, so we can technically define a Flink source as a subscriber to, I don't know, to those queues in Redis, right? Uh, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it's kind of hard to do it, okay? So it's not so easy. And uh, in the end, it turned out to be tricky. So writing Flink sources is not easy, okay? Um, and I'll show you how we did it in this case. So the key idea is sharding. So if you want to use it in a parallel environment like in Flink pipeline, you have to process things independently. So each shard basically is an independent map of those Uber items, okay? So we fan out all those items and we process, uh, we process them independently, but within each shard, we use consistent hashing, of course, because uh, all the updates for the same item should be processed on the same machine. And we use a pretty good sharding policies which collocate groups of items together. So the way we run our models is we typically run them on several items at once. And they're usually called like item groups or I don't know, item variants. So imagine that you're pricing similar items and we'd like to price them together. So in order to serve data properly, we have to keep the data in the same shard. Okay, so that's the idea for collocating. So keep your items that are processed together in, uh, in downstream in the same shard, okay? And then you can run those shards independently. So uh, we use replication. Uh, this is not necessary as you would rather have a good recovery in those shards. If you lose that in memory data in the shard, you would rather recover. And we have a store to recover from, which is Cassandra, right? So replication is strictly not necessary, but we can, we are using replication anyway. There's two reasons why. Uh, one reason is when we start downstream Flink pipelines, we don't know where Flink will schedule them, okay? Which machine? So there is no guarantee that Flink will be running a particular consumer on the same machine where the shards are, okay? So we would rather have a set of write replicas and read replicas. And we would like the, uh, the read replicas to be started where Flink cons source consumers are, okay? So this way, Flink consumers will be reading from local memory on the JVM that Flink run the consumers on, and our write replicas will be running on the machines that might be different, and uh, they're running where the uh, Flink publishers are, okay? That's where we uh, serve writes. And we just replicate read and write. So everyone, readers and writers are operating with local memory only, okay? And networking happens asynchronously. That's the idea for replication. Uh, back, backlog is strictly limited because the size of the shard is limited and the number of shards is limited, okay? So uh, in our experiments, we tend to run with uh, roughly five to 10 southern shards and within each shard, we are keeping between 100 southern and 500 southern items. So those are our parameters. And uh, together, all together, it's pretty large, but uh, it's still limited, okay? So consumers for the cache, those are the readers. And uh, they are launched by Flink as part of the uh, sharded source. They subscribe independently at any time. There is a coordinator that manages all of this. It's a singleton, similar to Kafka coordinator and it basically assigns shards for different consumers, okay? 
So once the shards are assigned, then each consumer can independently poll those shards. So they're sending periodically poll events and get the data out. Okay? And they operate at much lower speed than the rates. So gRPC microservices, this is very simple. So uh, if you ever use uh, Protobuf, then over time you tend to start using gRPC. gRPC is HTTP2 uh, duplex streaming service. So we can run gRPC clients within Flink and uh, deploy your servers in a different language. Typically our servers are in Python and uh, consumers are in Scala. And finally, for downstream integration, we have Kafka request response. This is unusual and don't recommend it. So if you want request response, don't use Kafka. <laughs> but Kafka is pretty much used in every company and uh, it's often imposed on you, centralized. And uh, typically you have HTTP request response services which tend to be slow and uh, don't impose any SLA on you. And then someone says, why don't we use Kafka for request response? Let's just do it, okay? And then there is a topic for request, topic for response, and you have to correlate. This is where the problems start to come, but we use it anyway. So it's a pair of Kafka, Flink, and Source implementing duplex streaming, and they, have, they share correlation IDs. And uh, we correlate them, and we, we event journal them in Cassandra because if you have a backlog in your request, which you typically have in Kafka, there's a bunch of requests that you don't have responses for, and, you, and your Flink pipelines fail. You have to recover, okay? So you have to have a table that represents Kafka backlog, which is silly in my opinion, because there's already a Kafka backlog in Kafka, but that's how you should do it anyway. And uh, this backlog may grow very large. So we, we run this like that for downstream. Okay, so I'll focus on the sharded cache on the next set of slides because everything else is pretty much standard. Okay, so this is the way we design our distributed data cache. We brought a lot of new code here. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the, uh, the modules in Akka that we use for it. Without Akka, it would be uh, too much work. But with Akka, it's not a lot of work actually. So. Basically, you want to publish into cache, and you want to read from cache, collect from cache, right? And you want cache to be a buffer, right? And it should be distributed. So if you start on the left, where you publish, um, you would like your cache to be replicated. So you would like to, to have some sort of a router that takes all those events and broadcasts them to different replicas. So this is already where I'm making one assumption, OK? Because there's two ways of doing it. One way is doing this broadcast, which means that you're running more of on a foreground, okay? And another way is you are fanning out those things. It goes to one particular replica. And then on the background, a replication process disseminates this over cluster. We tried both of these approaches. Actually, in Akka, by default, it's the background dissemination. So we write to one replica. In Akka, there's actually a, a policy. How many? Do you write local? Do you write to N consumers? Do you write to quorum, right? But most of the time, you just write local and let the, uh, let the background replication do the job. We tried it first because we liked it, and it turns out it's not scalable. So this background dissemination chokes the cluster at a certain point. So we actually tend to do it on the foreground right now. So there's a router that just broadcasts this to all the replicas, okay? But each replica is basically an independent set of the same sharding services. So we have a set of shards, and we basically run them as multiple services. So there is a sharding service 0, sharding service 1, sharding service n, n is number of replicas. And they are all kind of independent versions of each other. So locations of the shards, shards are chosen independently. That's why they can be anywhere, and that's why the replication works because your replicas tend to, uh, to be located on different machines, okay? And you can actually force the uh, location in Akka because there's a pluggable uh, shard allocation strategy, and you can start certain replica services on the machines that you want. For example, if I run my Flink job on a set of machines, I can start a replication service right there on those machines. So we can have uh, replica zero service for the writes, replica one service for the reads, and they will be uh, perfect replicas of each other. 
within each replica service. Uh, we apply sharding, and this is a fan out, okay? So uh, on each event that comes, we calculate shard ID, and all the events with the same shard ID, they go to the same shard, and shard is living on a particular JVM, okay? We have a lot of shards. So the more shards that you have, in my opinion, the better. And um, we run thousands of shards, okay? Within each shard, uh, we have multiple things. First of all, there's a data container, okay? So this is where we keep data. And it's a, basically a map of Uber items, okay? Then we have a set of indices because we want to do queries. So give me all the items where attribute n equal to this, okay? Then we have a thing called consumer group polling queues. So whenever there is a consumer group that registers, uh, we create a queue, and queue contains keys for the items that were recently updated, and they are applied in order, okay? So whenever consumer polls, then we just drain X events from the queue, and that's it. And finally, there is a recovery manager. So again, don't assume that everything is replicated, and uh, if you lose one replica, you will recover from another. So it's better to recover from a persistent store. So basically, recovery manager on the start of the shard, it queries Cassandra and recreates the shard data container. And whenever a consumer group is registered again, uh, we recreate the queue for this consumer, okay? This is based on the state of the consumer, and the state is coming from Flink state, okay? Typically, the state is just the last timestamp or some kind of an offset, right? So in our case, we use timestamps, Kafka using offsets. Finally, consumers. Uh, think about them as uh, ACA actors, um, which are started and run by Flink source. Okay, so they, in all respect, they are like Kafka consumers. So each consumer may pull from multiple shards. When they start, they register with a thing called coordinator. This is a one singleton service. All the shards register with it, all the consumers register with it. And it basically, whenever it thinks it's ready, it will send assignments of shards to consumers back to consumers, okay? And once consumers receive assignments, they know which shards to pull from, they start polling independently. And consumers periodically, as they pull, they receive data, they collect it, and they publish downstream. So the collect step is the output, and it's rate controlled. So this is determined by the polling parameters. Uh, and whenever we poll, we also ask the, uh, the shards about how much backlog they have, okay? This is allows us to allocate fairly, but guarantee that we'll pull exactly at the maximum rate. So this is all implemented with Akka. You can go and check what kind of goods Akka has, but uh, basically we use standard parts in Akka that is called cluster singleton, cluster router, cluster sharding, and distributed pops up. Okay, sharding is the most important one. It's a fine out part, okay? And uh, these are little toolkits that are readily available. So uh, you, most of the machinery you can just use for free from Akka. And if you want to build your own Kafka Cassandra and Redis, you can actually do it in a day. But they will be crappy. <laughs> so uh, you will start to add a lot of code as you start deploying them in production, okay? Because you will realize that you're hitting certain uh, performance bottlenecks. For example, we had a, this big surprise with distributed data, and we had to basically reject it and uh, rewrite it. So uh, the uh, output for Flink community is we now have a new pair of Flink source and sync. And we call them sharded cache source and sharded cache sync. Sync is very simple. Source is, source is uh, more sophisticated. Um, maybe we'll contribute this, but the idea is that this is an ACA-based uh, cache source, and you will have to run the, uh, the shards exactly in the way that the source may work with. So it's like there's a server and there's a client. So if you want to use the source, you will have to deploy the cache in the same way as we did. So we'll have to, to contribute both the server and the, uh, the Flink wrappers. So uh, other than sync, we also have an async map. And 
async map is the easiest way to consume from cache. Basically, uh, you have a async map operator in Flink, and you can query the cache, right? Uh, it's basically a async map operator and a flat map. It's easy, but it actually moves the data over the network. So uh, if you realize that you move a lot of data over the network, you would rather s switch it as a proper sync. So sync will run, sorry, not sync, but source. Source will run in the same JVMs as shards live, okay? So you don't have to move the data over the network. Um, but you cannot have an arbitrary query there. You'll get everything. So some uh, findings from the actual deployment and usage. So we run this as a collocated cluster with Flink JVMs. So we start our own ACA system within Flink JVM. Flink has its own ACA, and we uh, add a second ACA into it. There is no conflicts. That's pretty good, because the ACA guys made sure about it. But you can also run it as a standalone cluster deployed on the same machines. Then there will be no, conf no concerns. RAM and I.O. are crucial. RAM for the cache and I.O. for the, uh, for the replication, OK? So monitoring is super important. So you have to, to monitor everything there. Because at any point of time, your message may get stuck in some actor's mailbox, OK? And you would like to know about this. So it's better if you use metrics, but you may also need tracing, OK? So throughput performance is very good. So uh, we, we can run our cache sources with the rate of roughly 1,000 messages per second for each Flink subtask. So you can run many subtasks, that's your parallelism of Flink, and you can run, I'll say, 20,000 messages per sec or 30,000 messages per sec. Pretty good, okay? Our cache query latencies, 95% is under three milliseconds, and our writes are always under one millisecond. So that's the performance that we want to get. And uh, typically with Kafka and Ray Alexander, you will not get these numbers. You will get pretty good numbers, but then they will not be as good as that. Uh, the bottleneck here might be in cache recovery. Whenever we restart everything, so we use a lot of shards, 15 to 20,000 shards. When you need to recover all of them, it may take tens of minutes. So if you do a full cluster restart, that's expensive. So you would rather do a rolling cluster restart whenever you need to upgrade. And that's it. Are there questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah, that looks like an imp impressive piece of software. <laughs> Are we going to share it and release it, maybe? We plan to share it. Um, Walmart Labs has an open source policy. I am actually navigating through all the aspects of it, but we plan to share it, yes. Again, uh, you would have to run both the server and the Flink wrappers. So basically, you would have to deploy an ACA distributed cache cluster for this. OK, so unfortunately, we're out of time for more questions in the session, but you can approach the speaker after the session, I, I think so. So now we also have our lunch break, um, and you can get the lunch downstairs in the Palais. So let's thank again our speaker. Thank you very much.